Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Bom dia a todas e todos. We are pleased to have with us today here Professor Ren Hirschel, who is Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Toronto. Professor Hirschel is a distinguished scholar of public comparative and constitutional law and comparative politics. And he has greatly shaped our contemporary debates and ideas on the political dynamics underlying the empowerment of judicial institutions, the methodology and the very identity of the field of comparative constitutional law, and the intersection of power, constitutionalism and religion, among other facets of his research agenda. Professor Herschel has also been an active supporter of the regionalization of the International Society for Public Law, ICONES. And this event is organized by the Brazilian chapter of ICONES, which was founded in 2019 and is currently co-directed by Stefania Barbosa and myself. And I'm Diego Werneck from INSPE. Professor Herschel has kindly accepted our invitation to discuss with us his new book, City State, Constitutionalism in the Mega City, setting the agenda for discussions in two panels today. So after his initial keynote lecture, Professors Virgilio Afonso da Silva from the University of Sao Paulo and Stefania Barbosa from the Federal University of Paraná will engage with his arguments, presenting comments. This panel will be fully conducted in English and I will moderate it. In the afternoon, we have a second panel specifically engaged with Brazilian law and policy and that panel will be conducted in Portuguese. And Professors Angela Costaldello, Bianca Tavolari and Rosângela Lemurt We'll discuss the applicability and implications of the concept of mega city in a specifically Brazilian context. So the second panel will begin at 2.30 p.m. Brazilian time. And please note that the second panel will use a different link, a link which you should also have received in the confirmation email. And before, be, before we begin, I would just like to remind you that all your microphones are muted, but you can still use the chat to ask questions. I will select a couple of questions from the chat only if there is enough time, but I will try. And once again, many thanks to Professor Herschel for sharing these new exciting arguments with us and to Professors Stefani and Virgilio for agreeing to act as commentators. commentators. So please, without further delay, Professor Herschel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diego, and thank you, everyone. Before I begin, let me just uh, start the share screen so we'll make sure that everything is working properly. Can you see what's on the screen now and can you hear me well? Excellent. Yes. So uh, before I start, I want to again uh, thank the hosts of uh, the event for approaching me. Uh, there's nothing more gratifying for a scholar who has just published a new book than um, interest from the community. Our ideas are worth close to nothing without engagement from the scholarly community within which we work. So I very much appreciate the opportunity. I also want to say that I wear, one of the hats I wear here is that of the former co-president of ICONES, and if I may say so, one of the founding fathers of the society alongside Joseph Weiler and others. And I can tell you that when we were sitting um, at NYU uh, in 2012 and uh, trying to sketch the contours of the society and how, how it would look like, uh, it was not even in our wildest dreams that we thought that so many people would be interested. And I'm in particular happy that uh, we now have a thriving uh, national chapter in Brazil. And some of my good colleagues and friends uh, that uh, I see in conferences are running it. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. And uh, as we all know, whether we are we think it's fortunate or unfortunate, Brazil is a living laboratory for constitutional politics and has been like that over the last couple of decades. So it's a tremendous pleasure to contribute to the efforts of uh, ICONES Brazil. Um, and with that in mind, let's jump immediately to business. And our business today is to talk about a new book of mine um, that raises some, I hope, 
interesting ideas and interesting questions concerning one of the most significant um, social, political, and economic phenomena of our time, namely urban agglomeration and the rise of megacities. Um, so let's begin the uh, presentation. There will be some slides, and in the end, I look forward to um, uh, entertaining some comments and thoughts and questions. So uh, this is a graph that uh, many of you can track down on the internet and it's readily available and it shows the urbanization worldwide over the last, um, over the last um, um, 500 years. So the trend is obvious. When we look closer, and this is a graph that I um, uh, created, you can see if you compare the purple line, which is world population over the last um, almost century, and urban population, which is the blue line, you can see that the rise of world population is almost parallel to the rise of urban population in billions worldwide. Um, so clearly we have a significant pattern here. Here we can see another way of um, uh, presenting that same data, the rise of urban population and the relative decline in the size worldwide of so-called rural population. And as of 2010, um, the urban population worldwide crossed the 50% mark. And we are now um, heading towards approximately 70% of the world population living in cities come 2050. Here is a very interesting table. It presents a lot of data, but uh, I think the most interesting, so the left part of the table shows the proportion of urban population, uh, of total population, and the right half of the table shows the actual number in millions of urban population by continent. And you can see that the rise in Latin America, Asia, and Africa uh, is dramatic. In particular, Asia, if you look at the most right-hand column of the, of the uh, table, you will see that the rise of urban population in Asia is incredible. But the same goes for Africa and to some lesser extent in Latin America, much less so in Europe and North America. This is another way of presenting the same data. The green line, which obviously speaks for itself, is the rise of urban population in Asia. The sort of orange line is the rise of urban population in Africa. And the gray line is the rise of urban population in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we can see that in Europe and in North America, the rise of urban population has been relatively um, steady and not particularly uh, striking compared to the so-called global south, and we will uh, um, return to that point later. So now we can see, this is the simplest way to show the data, we can see that from 1960 to 2018, 88% of growth in urban population worldwide took place in the global south, and um, from 2018 to 2050, uh, it'll be more like 96% of all uh, urban growth um, in the world concentrated in the so-called global south. So that, that uh, piece of information is absolutely crucial, I will argue in a couple of minutes, in our analysis of the constitutional status of megacities and urban agglomeration in general. And the entire concept of focusing on the global north as a sort of good thing when uh, constitutionalism um, um, is invoked is just not applicable in the context of uh, cities and urbanization because we need some original thinking emanating from the global south. And I will emphasize that later. This is the rise in the number of mega cities over time and uh, this requires no, um, no explanation, it speaks for itself. And obviously, uh, urban agglomeration is a global phenomenon and with 
urban agglomeration come the rise of mega cities and uh, your country features two such mega cities, at least depending on how you count, but clearly Rio and Sao Paulo are considered mega cities by global standards. But of course there are other, uh, depending on how you count, used to be 5 million, now it's 10 million, and um, in some quarters it's 10 million for the entire urban um, uh, region. So it, depending, it depends on what definition we um, deploy, but generally the trend is clear. So here, just by way of uh, completing the introduction, we have some more data and city population over 1 million used to be just 12 such cities a century ago. Uh, now we are in the vicinity of 600 and approaching 1,000 and you can read the numbers for yourselves. It's, uh, it's obvious. Um, and New York, that used to be, you know, used to be considered the largest city in the world and the paradigmatic example of megacity, um, is barely in the top 10 these days. Uh, the projection of the UN population research um, is uh, that uh, cities such as Lagos, Kinshasa, Dar es Salaam, Mumbai, Karachi will be by far in the way the largest cities in uh, a couple of decades, home to something like 60, 70, and even 80 million people. So I think this is mind boggling. So a few uh, photos. Um, so this is Mexico, part of Mexico City. This is part of Lagos. I hope you can see all the images fairly clearly. This is part of Lagos. Uh, this is uh, in, um, Karachi. Um, this is uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh. Uh, I was really stunned to take that photo. This is, um, I believe, Mexico City as well, although I'm not sure. This is Hong Kong. It's a fairly famous image of, uh, of uh, workers' residents in Hong Kong. This, I think, is Rio. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, this, for sure, is Mumbai. And we will talk about those intra-metropolis differences in a minute. So the picture is clear. Here is what I do in the book. The first thing I do is I try to um, highlight that there is an, an, an almost inexplicable gap between the extensive study of the urban scene in the human sciences and virtual science, in, in virtual silence in uh, constitutional thought. So there's almost nothing in constitutional thought, very little. Um, it's certainly not in comparative constitutional law, and we will talk about it in a minute. The second thing I try to do is what do, to explore what do constitutions say and do not say about cities. Um, then I try to focus on the global south, virtually all attempt to, attempts to grant cities constitutional status and standing are in the global south, and uh, obviously Brazil is one of them, and we will talk about this uh, later. Um, one of the other things I try to do in the book is consider how to materialize Henri Lefebvre's right to the city. So some of you may be familiar with this. It was very popular in Brazil um, about 20 years ago when the city statute was uh, adopted, I believe in 2001, but you will know the details. Um, and uh, so I think Brazilian scholars of constitutional law and constitutional theory are relatively more familiar with the concept of the right to the city than uh, my colleagues in Toronto or in North America or in Germany. Um, and what I try to do in the book is try to understand what makes, what makes cities unique. So what are the features of the urban condition that make cities unique? Um, what cities aim to do things like you know, human rights cities and international networks and stuff like that, sometimes even urban citizenship. And also, and this is one of the main efforts of the book, what concepts and doctrines from constitutional law may be put forward in an attempt to grant cities enhanced constitutional standing. And in the background, I try not to forget, although it's not easy, 
um, the rising tension between uh, rural and urban um, uh, uh, parts of countries. And this has become a major issue in so-called populist politics over the last 10, 15 years. So these are the main things that the book attempts to do. And, you know, as with every first, it raises more questions than it has answers. So if you compare a book like this um, to say a book on freedom of expression or freedom of religion or on federalism or on judicial review, where, you know, obviously there are dozens of books, if not hundreds of books on each of these concepts. Here, I found it very difficult to come along major books to try to address the issue of urban agglomeration and the mega city the way I was trying to accomplish in this book. And as I said, it's more of an invitation for a conversation for the comparative constitutional community than it is a conclusive treatise on the subject that is not realistic to achieve in what I think is either a first or one of the first books that try to do something like this. So when we reach 100 books on this, I will aim to write, to write something conclusive, but uh, we have some work, collective work to do on this. Okay, let's uh, zoom in on some of the, no pun intended, let's zoom in, zoom in on some of the um, more concrete dimensions here. So, um, classical, and you, you will know most of this, but classical works of political theory deal with the city, and the city has been the subject of some utopian and avant-garde, uh, you know, political thought over the years, and there's definitely novel thinking about uh, urbanization and cities throughout the human sciences, and some of the most Common names are, of course, uh, you know, Henri Lefebvre that I mentioned, and Saskia Sassen. I hope you've uh, heard of her work, and Paul Krugman, who won the Nobel Prize on his work on economies of scale in cities, and Richard Florida, who deals with cities and the creative class, and uh, Manuel Castells, and of course, ben Benjamin Barber, that wrote a famous book on, you know, what, what would happen if mayors ruled the world. And by a stark contrast, very little of this intellectual flurry uh, has penetrated the world of um, constitutional law and constitutional thought. So one of the questions I ask in the book is why the literature on constitutional thought is silent on the issue of urban agglomeration and the issue of cities. And I try to develop the, the thesis that uh, the, the constitutional project worldwide is a national project. And it's linked closely to the Westphalian understanding of uh, you know, what the state is. And so obviously um, national constitutions have this nationalist vision or at least statist vision um, um, in their head, so to speak. And so they remain uh, resentful of the idea and skeptical or agnostic at best of the idea of empowering uh, cities. In any event, there is a big gap between what the social sciences and humanities, um, how they treat the urban condition over the last uh, few decades and the you know, blind spot, so to speak, to use a North American phrase, the blind spot of constitutional law with respect to the city. Here are three, I mean, there are many of those, but here are three, you know, big books, handbooks, so to speak, on comparative constitutional law. I should, for the sake of full disclosure, say that I'm the contributor uh, in two of those. And I'm as, as um, you know, as responsible for this omission as anyone else. So here we have a total of, in those three books, um, we total of more than 130 chapters, almost 3,000 pages, not a single chapter on, constitu on the constitutional status of cities, uh, as we saw uh, home to the majority of the world. So clearly we have a big gap here, and we as a community of constitutional scholars need to think about it. Why the constitutional blind spot? So we can speculate on this. 
obviously this is not you know uh, framed in the form of testable hypothesis so to speak um, but I raise a few suggestions why the constitutional community is relatively silent on the issue of cities and um, the first one is of course um, constitutional rigidity and path dependence so if you think about the American constitution this is uh, a document that was adopted over 200 years ago. There were no mega cities in sight. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to amend most national constitutions. So there is this idea of constitutional rigidity and path dependence. I, I think it's obvious. Then there is this notion of spatial statism that is linked closely to the idea of the a Westphalian statist outlook embedded in national constitutions, as I explained earlier constitutionalism and national constitutions as a statist project that has the state and its institutions in mind uh, and is less concerned with other forms of self-governing. Um, the third idea that I raise in that part of the book is that cities may be viewed by states as potential competitors and uh, you know some jurisdictional competitors, some competitors in terms of public policy. And in some cases, cities may be viewed by states as potential uh, sites of revolution and uprising. And we, we see this all the time. This is not merely hypothetical. If you open the news and see what happened in the, in the US two months ago in some American cities, that took place in big American cities, not in rural areas. Um, and obviously Hong Kong and Santiago de Chile, and uh, you remember the, the, the images from Tahrir Square in, the, in Cairo uh, a few years ago, and the French Revolution, if we go back to Paris uh, of, you know, of the late 18th century. So obviously cities, because they are so dense uh, and so many people live there and they are home to monumental government buildings and stuff like that and and plazas and and so it's relatively easy for revolutionary for people to come together and for revolutionary ideas to spread so states have this existential fear of cities that are overly independent um, and then another idea that i try to raise in this part of the book is that large cities are consistently more diverse, cosmopolitan and socially progressive than the rest of the country. And this is evidence that we see everywhere. Mexico City was the first jurisdiction in Mexico to allow for abortions and for gay marriage. Tokyo, the same with respect to Japan. London voted uh, against Brexit, while the rest of uh, the UK voted largely for it. Tel Aviv in Israel is by far more progressive than the rest of the country. And Istanbul voted earlier this year a progressive mayor against uh, Erdogan and the same in Budapest against Orban. So clearly cities are, I don't, I don't want to use the word leftist, but, but you, you understand what I'm trying to say. Cities are generally more leftist than the rest of the country. So maybe states are fearful of that. Let's move on to the second part of what I try to do in the book and some examples of how countries treat cities. So in the US, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this and we don't have the time to go into details, but the doctrines that govern the um, 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 cities in the US, and we are talking Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and all those big places, um, were formulated in the mid 19th century and the Supreme Court ruled in the beginning of the 20th century over 100 years ago that uh, American cities are completely subject to state jurisdiction. And what we've seen in the US, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, to what extent this happens in Brazil, I don't think so. We have a lot of so-called preemptive legislation. So the states legislate in an attempt to preempt cities from adopting progressive legislation on gun control, on minimum wage, on sanctuary cities, you know, cities that try to accommodate immigrants and things of that nature. 
So we think, oh, well, this is the US. The place is crazy, nothing you can do about it. But if we look at Canada, that many of us uh, view as more socially progressive than the US, we see that the situation of cities is even worse than the US. So Canadian cities are completely in the hands of the provinces and um, what you have at the, we won't go into details. I'm happy to answer any questions on this. This is a document that was adopted, the Canadian constitution, its first part adopted in 1867. And in, when the city of Toronto had 40,000 people, it now has seven and a half million. And the same rules continue to govern the city. At the bottom, you see at the center, the person standing is John A. Macdonald, uh, the founding constitution, you know, the founding father of the Canadian constitution. And you can see, I picked this picture because these are all male. Uh, this is 1866, 1867. These are all male, all white. And you can see that they are in, not in an urban area. They are in a rural area next to the St. Lawrence River. So clearly megacities was not, the idea of megacities was not on their minds when they adopted the Canadian constitution. By contrast, and I call it here, you know, Northern stagnation, Southern, um, um, Southern innovation, the global South, and I'm not sure I like this phrase, but, but never mind, we'll use it for the purposes of our discussion and you'll, you'll forgive me because this entire North-South thing is, is complicated, but we leave it for now. Just bear with me. Most constitutional innovation on cities emanates from the so-called Global South. So in the Global North, there's virtually nothing or close to nothing. Um, why is it? We can speculate that in the Global South, there is necessity. So as we just saw, over 95% of urban growth takes place in the Global South. We can also speculate that many Global South constitutions are just newer constitutions like Brazil 1988 or South Africa 1996. Um, and in some of these countries, it was relatively easier to change the constitution or at least um, um, the distinction between, you know, the constitution is less revered than, you know, say the American constitution that is considered in any event, we can speculate, but I think the most plausible understanding is that most Global South constitutions are just newer and are more aware of the, um, of the changing demographics and geography. Um, so a few illustrative cases of strong constitutional protection of cities. And here we have two models, I guess, one more or three. One model is, let's call it the China model where you pick, but it's not only in China, it's also in South Korea, Vietnam, and in other countries, where they pick some big cities and give those big cities um, constitutional status similar to that of provinces. So the city itself becomes a province or a state, depending on land in German terms. Um, and China designated four such big cities in its constitution. The second model, is address of cities and local government across the board without differentiating particular cities. And here we have obviously Brazil, which is a, I believe a worldwide pioneer on that in 1988. And um, this is very interesting. Unfortunately, my Portuguese is so bad that I won't be able to uh, follow the discussions in the second panel. But obviously Brazil, a couple of articles, 182, 183, you will know much better than I, and, um, um, and the city statute of 2001, and all the politics when Lula uh, created the Ministry of Cities in 2003, I believe, and then uh, your current boss uh, essentially eliminated it uh, probably the first week of his, uh, of his new government. Uh, but I don't want to get into Brazilian politics because I, um, you definitely know much more than I. Um, India uh, did the same. Uh, it adopted two amendments to its constitution in 93. And I think the most significant attempt other than Brazil is in South Africa. The constitution of South Africa has an entire chapter uh, on the status of cities that explicitly reverses the apartheid related urban policy. 
Uh, so this is a very progressive attempt. It's very similar in concept, not in details, to what happened in Brazil in 1988. Another interesting example is Mexico City. And this is something that should occupy our, our um, collective thought more, you know, more closely. Mexico City used to be a federal district, you know, like, uh, like Brasilia, like Washington, D.C., like, like all these places. And in 2013, in the process that uh, was concluded in 2017, it was freed, so to speak, from the federal government and turned into an autonomous state, just like any other state in Mexico. And it had to adopt a new constitution. And this was and is still to date the largest experiment in constitution making via so-called crowdsourcing, where people send their submissions, etc. So public participation in constitution making. Let's now move to talk about some of the problems I identify in the book. No need to follow the details here. Uh, these, some of the slides here are used for teaching and since uh, I wasn't sure how good the line will be, I put everything on slides, but don't feel obliged to read everything I will explain. Um, so let's explore some of the problems that, uh, that um, I identify in the book in terms of city representation. So in quite a few countries, we have a problem that I, um, that I term in the book, one person, half a vote. Um, all sorts of constitutionally entrenched electoral malapportionment. So things that are fixed in the constitution and make it very difficult for urban interests to be represented properly in the, at the national level. And I have a few examples here um, uh, no need to go into details. I think the most obvious example here is India, where the city of Mumbai is about one quarter of the state, state of Maharashtra, but because of all sorts of constitutionally entrenched maneuvers to reduce the power of the city of Mumbai, it only has one eighth of the seats in, in the national parliament in, um, in um, India. And Again, I'm no expert on Brazil, but it would appear that Brazil suffers from some of these problems, either at the, at the lower house uh, and to some extent at the uh, Senate where the representation, if I, I mean, if, when Virgilio is in the room, I'm not making any claims, but I'm guessing if I know correctly, you know, there are 27 states or 26 plus the federal district and, you know, three representatives for each in the Senate and there are issues of urban representation there as well. We have now new literature in political science that suggests that in first past the post um, electoral systems, there is consistent underrepresentation for urban uh, politicians and urban interests for all sorts of concentration issues, mainly because so-called leftist candidates win big in cities and so-called right-wing candidates win less big in the countryside. But if you aggregate the votes, you see a consistent loss of votes for the left. We also have the so-called Chicago-Zurich problem. There is a progressive city in a larger, far less progressive uh, state or province or canton. And so cities are less represented. And in the book, I go at some length in offering some some electoral uh, modi or modifications to electoral systems that might allow better representation for urban centers without compromising on rural interests. And we can think about mixed um, rural urban districts. We can think about um, uh, splitting the split canton idea of city and the countryside and so on. We don't have the time to talk about the technicalities read the book. It's a good idea anyway. Um, um, another challenge that I identify in the book is the challenge of extreme density. So our constitutional thought is based on the idea, or it's basically completely silent on the whole problem of many more people concentrated on, in small territory and 
vast parts of the country are essentially vacant or very sparsely populated. So we have, uh, because of this Westphalian statist understanding of borders and territory, constitutional thought hasn't paid much attention to issues of density. And I try to scratch the surface of this. This is very relevant, not only to extreme density, but also to very low density. So you can think about people who are very remote from the center or people about people who are concentrated in mega cities in conditions that would overwhelm you. And uh, I, when I got these numbers, I couldn't believe it. So Dhaka, we are not talking here some slums, so to speak. Again, I don't like this word, but I mean, we'll use it. Dhaka, the city, the whole city has a, a, a citywide um, density of 46,000 people per square kilometer. Again, this is not one neighborhood, it's the whole city. And you have some international comparators there. We'd like to think of Hong Kong as a dense place. It's not even close. You have the numbers there. New York City during the day when everyone commutes into the city is 11,000 people per square kilometer. Dhaka is more than four times denser than that. It's, it's crazy. And of course, we are not even talking about so-called urban slums, so poor neighborhoods. And unfortunately, when I grew up, I'm old enough to say that, you know, when I grew up in the 80s, Brazil was unfortunately uh, one of the commonly used examples for the concentration of these neighborhoods. Maybe the situation now is different, but I recall when I grew up, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this film. I watched the uh, Pichotche and the, these, you know, and this is, this was bad. Um, and this is, if you haven't seen it, go see it and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, the world, uh, the, the dubious world record holder here is a neighborhood in Mumbai called Daravi uh, that has um, a, a de density of 300,000 people per square kilometer you will appreciate the gesture that I did for Brazil here last night. Uh, this is equivalent of squeezing the entire world population, 7.6 billion people into the state of Vermont or into the state of Alagoas. This is, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, this is slightly south of um, Pernambuco, right? Slightly the, to the south of uh, Recife, right? Um, this is another way of uh, presenting that uh, data, it speaks for itself. So density is a major issue and it's a major challenge for the um, realization of so-called social and economic rights in, uh, in big cities. And we have to think about this creatively. Here is another uh, issue that I raise in the book, urban super diversity. So, so this is not just diversity, this is super diversity because in big cities we have the intersection of virtually everything we know about diversity, religion, ethnicity, language, sexual preference, age, everything you want is concentrated in cities. So it's not just one dimensional diversity, it's multi-dimensional diversity. And there's nothing like cities where we, we can see nowhere else and we can see such form of super diversity and we might want to consider uh, um, the special status that cities may have in some issues based on this idea of super diversity. They're just substantively or maybe substantively different. The urban interaction, and this is as implications upon democracy, is just very different in terms of its intensity and diversity than human interaction in other forms of settlement. And what you have here is some data, but really it speaks for itself and it's obvious. We all live in cities and we all understand how much more diverse they are than other forms of settlement. Let's talk about another idea that I raise in the book, stakeholding and subsidiarity. So these are two, you know, obvious well-known principles in uh, political theory and subsidiarity in constitutional theory as well. The idea that uh, the closer people are to, you know, to the effects of uh, a given policy, they should have a larger stake in making a decision on that issue. 
and the stakeholding theory may warrant other variables held equal that city dwellers have greater stake in decisions concerning the city. So that may warrant some greater autonomy in decision making for city dwellers. Um, the idea of subsidiarity is well known to many of you, so no need to elaborate on that. But it too suggests in its pure form that whatever may be done at the lower level of government should be done at the lower level of government because it's closer to the people. These are not just hot air ideas. Uh, they, are, they have many manifestations in public law around the world, in particular the Treaty on the European Union and in other places where ideas of stakeholding and subsidiarity are widely held. Let's talk about another issue that often I talk about with my American colleagues and they're pissed off about it, but that's uh, um, sell out to corporate interests. So because cities have relatively low taxation capacity or independent taxation capacity, and they are at the mercy of either state government or federal government, and in unitary states, the national government. They are almost structurally dependent on big business. So cities, unlike capital, are fixed in place. They are anchored, they cannot move. So this idea of capital flight is not applicable. You know, where, where you know, corporate business tells you if you don't lower taxes, if you do this or that, we move to Singapore, we move to India, we move to China, all that stuff. Cities cannot move anywhere, they're there. The people can move, but the cities cannot move. Um, and the fact too is that cities lack constitutional standing or sufficient taxing power. And so what happens is cities must rely on big business and big business money. And they sell it to us as of course, oh, this is all good and you know, cooperative work with big business, but we understand what's the vision of cities that stands behind it. Um, the, uh, I, the examples are many and I explore many examples, all these examples in the book and those of you who have read it will know what I'm talking about, but I think the, the most outrageous example I, I could think of is how the city of Chicago sold its entire parking revenue until 2083 to Morgan Stanley. 75 years of parking for a little more than $1 billion. The investors will have recovered this in 2021, the investment. And from 2021 or 2022, they'll have 62 more years of net revenue. So every time you park your car in Chicago, think about that. Um, and it also turned out that that part of the Morgan Stanley investment wing is owned by um, United Arab Emirates. So every time a citizen of Chicago parks his or her car in Chicago, money goes to United Arab Emirates. And all of this is because the city of Chicago lacked taxation power back when it signed the, and it needed the cash now. There are many examples like this, and I'm sure you have ex similar examples in Brazil. Um, what we have here is, um, you know, uh, m some of you might have heard of the so-called Amazon um, Headquarter 2 uh, bid that American cities essentially offered Amazon all sorts of crazy stuff so that Amazon opens a second headquarter in that city. And what you have to the left here, if you can still follow all the details, is the bid that the city of Boston, this is like Harvard, MIT, Boston. Yes, one of the first cities in American history, almost begged Amazon to come there. And this is the cover, or one of the pages from the brochure they prepared for Amazon. And Airbnb is an ongoing issue how uh, there is a big decision of the European Court of Justice last month on that. We can talk about it later. But the general idea here is that the less constitutional power cities have, the greater the likelihood they will engage in too friendly relationship with corporate business rather than protecting the business of the, the interests of its dwellers. Maybe two, three more quick ideas and then I'll stop and hear your reactions. 
Another idea that is common in federations is the idea of equalization or fiscal federalism, so to speak, where more, you know, better off states transfer money through the federal government to uh, worse off states. Uh, I think you have that arrangement in Brazil as well. Um, um, what you have here is a graph that shows very quickly the situation in Canada uh, with the 10 provinces and the red is what the provinces can generate by themselves and the blue is what they get through this equalization. And you can see that uh, Ontario, this is ON in the middle, is sort of breaks even. But uh, as I show in the book, and again, we don't have the time to go into details, the socioeconomic gaps within big metropolitan areas far exceed the gaps among subnational units. So even in Toronto, that is more equal of these big cities, it's one to six, while nationally it's one to two. In New York City, it's one to 13. In Mumbai, it's one to 21. And the data speaks for itself. So why is this relevant for our business? It raises the issue of the unit question in federations. Is it, is it still completely justifiable to treat state boundaries as the holy grail here, as the sort of Bible, when we know that shift of population may suggest that the whole concept of constituent unit in federalism may point to some increased power to cities, or at least treating cities as units, as constituent units in the context of federalism. Another idea is environmental protection. Um, one of the biggest challenges of our century, I don't think we need to quarrel about that. It's obvious now, the data is there. There is simply no solution to the environmental um, hazards that we face on planet Earth without city, not only collaboration, but without city leadership. There's no way to resolve this. Precisely because the vast majority of world population lives in cities, what we do with our garbage, what we do with our water, what we do with our buildings, what we do with our air pollution, all of this is city related. There is no way we can treat this without paying attention to how cities govern themselves and what powers they have to govern themselves. The evidence is still very scattered, but one example that I bring in the book is Buenos Aires that in 1994 was granted the status of a federal, uh, uh, a, a, of, a, of a state. So in, much like Mexico City, essentially. And it immediately started to adopt environmentally friendly policies to the extent that it's now one of the greenest cities in Latin America and indeed in the world. So we need to think about power to cities also in the context of environmental protection. There's simply no solution to this problem without more uh, public policy power to cities. Maybe the last idea I'll explore here, social housing. So this is a big deal as well. Uh, we are talking, again, I don't know if this is common in Brazil, but in many other countries, there is this idea that cities ought to provide some um, affordable housing to its residents at least some. And the evidence here is clear. The more autonomous power cities have, the greater the likelihood they spend on social housing, on affordable housing. Um, and one of the world leaders in that respect is Johannesburg, that as I said in, in the South African constitution of 96, was granted constitutional powers and the South African constitutional court approved that in a big decision in 2010, where it held that cities have exclusive authority over municipal planning, including zoning and land use management. And immediately the city of Johannesburg adopted a new law that 30% of every construction project for housing must include, the 30% must be designated for so-called affordable housing. This is massive and without powers to the city, not gonna happen. 
to conclude, I don't know how, how we do on time. I think we are still pretty good. So to conclude, urban agglomeration is one of the most burning policy challenges of the 21st century. And as I showed you earlier, the current figures are absolutely mind boggling. By 2050, 70% of the world population or more will be living in cities. But the, the numbers concerning 2100, you know, the 22nd century are really, it's not even futuristic as, uh, you know, dystopian, really near dystopian. Um, we as constitutional scholars must begin to think about what to do with this challenge that I view as one of the biggest challenges of um, um, the human race as of 2020. We may not pay, pay much attention to this right now, but it's in the same league as the environmental challenge. And obviously assuming we are now overcoming, we will overcome the pandemic, the global pandemic sometime, the urban challenge will remain. And we have to begin to think about it much more seriously. It just doesn't make sense that we have just a handful of books and articles on this issue when it clearly is one of the biggest challenges of humanity. And if there is anything to be learned from the global pandemic we are currently at, is that cities are at the forefront of this struggle and are required to deliver the goods and that density matters a great deal for people who can't even wash their hands or can't even think about social distancing. How can you social distance in places that are, that are so densely populated? We are all fortunate to have our own apartments and own services and all that, but it's, it's not shared by everyone. So I would argue, and I guess that's the bottom line of the book, it, the book issues an invitation for the comparative constitutional scholarly community to engage in a closer conversation about the issue of urbanization, its challenge, and what may be done, and to begin to think creatively about what may be done through constitutional law to amend the problem. I do appreciate that the problem is much wider than constitutional law, but what can we say? You know, physicists talk about physics, chemists talk about chemistry. We are constitutional scholars. We talk about what may be done through constitutional law to address this. And one last comment. Some of the discussion is concentrated in so-called municipal law or so-called administrative law. This is not good enough, I would argue. Our constitution is not just who does what. Our constitution reflects who we are as a nation. What are the values? What are the priorities? What are the preferences that we wish to emphasize? This is our public face, so to speak, how we want to run our country. What do we stand for? And I think given the fact that the urban challenge is so massive worldwide, yet it has so little reference in constitutional thought, the time has come that more constitutions and more constitutional scholars pay attention to it. And I'm very happy that this discussion occurs in the context of Iconest Brazil, because Brazil is one of the world leaders in thinking about the issue, in constitutionalizing, or at least experimenting with constitutionalizing it. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hirschu. And uh, I'll then, now let's hear Stefania's comments and then we hear Brigidio's comments. Um, uh, I would first like to thank Professor Hirschu for accepting our invitation to debate your new book. Uh, I would also like to thank Professor Vigilio uh, who has immediately accepted our invitation to join us in this discussion. Uh, the originality of Professor Herschel's scholarship can be ascertained from his other books. Uh, 
um, such as juristocracy and the constitutional theocracy. The study of comparative constitutional law is critical to think about our global problems from different perspectives. It's a great book, Professor. <laughs> Actually, uh, constitutional scholars usually don't think about these problems inherent in cities. And issues in Brazil restricted to administrative and urban scholars. So thank you for opening our mind to thinking about classical constitutional studies with this new filter. To, to change the classical public law preponderation from a statist territory perspective to a notion that empowers the new arrangements of megacities is a real different kind of thinking on the role of constitutionalism and its relationship to promoting human rights in the different levels of governance. I'd like to divide my talk uh, with some provocations and thoughts that I had when reading the book and some questions relating to think of the Brazilian megacities problems. We, we are watching in Brazil, but not just here, a process of democratic erosion and the rise of conservative parts worldwide. Separatist movements, anti-refugees and anti-human rights discourses take force all around the world. You demonstrate that in different countries, the sub-representation of urban people in the national parliament makes the conservatives have an advantage in the political, in the political process. In Brazil, the example of Sao Paulo that you gave in the book is expressive, not just in Senate, but also um, uh, in the deputies' house. Um, you defend in the book that people in mega seats are more progressive and compromised with human rights, and that you can have a mass mobilization and popular political resistance. Which do you think works better? Protests creating tension with the national and federal government or trying to change the constitutional design and the electoral system in a way that allows for more equal, equal participation to urban, uh, urban voters? How to think about these changes without promoting tension and even more uh, the divide of the societies between liberal and tolerant urban people and uh, uh, versus conservative non-urban people. In this sense, thinking about the empowerment of megacities, would, um, would there be another way of limiting the central power and eventual containment of the central government traditionally more conservative. Uh, in the case of Brazil, with clear authoritarian tendencies. In Brazil, the Ministry of Cities Extinction demonstrates the attempt to remove powers and money from cities to establish a, de a dependency policy between the municipality and the federal government. Although we only have two mega cities in Brazil, I wonder if it would not be the case to have different levels of strengthening also to other uh, large cities and greater financial autonomy. Today, Brazilian cities deal with the collection of taxes on real estate and services, which favors the policy of subservience with the federal government maintaining the idea of dependency that you said on political alignment between federal, state and mega city leaders. Some of the well established mega cities experiences include national cities, but others have a real autonomous region like Hong Kong, the city of Mexico and Buenos Aires. National cities uh, work as federal districts, maybe, 
with more fiscal autonomy, state taxes, special resources, and administra administration provided directly by the national government. Can national cities maintain political control by the national government besides the city autonomy? Are experiences such as Hong Kong, the city of Mexico and Buenos Aires, which are autonomous in their constitutions, better than those of CAM, the Central Administrated Municipalities in China, not only from administrative and efficiency perspective, but from a democratic one. Here in Brazil, Professor Lynch is defending that Rio should be a second federal district. The city would have the state tax revenue, but an act of autonomy since the primary responsibilities would still be held with the federal government. What do you think about this proposal? Another interesting point uh, is uh, the contradiction between the state discoursing, claiming to use the margin of appreciation in the fulfillment of their obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights, allowing member states to have a diverse interpretation. This contrasts the treatment given to local authorities, where a diverse interpretation is strictly forbidden. Here in Brazil, the Supreme Court jurisprudence has centralized the power more and more at the federal level, despite the regional autonomy conferred to the states and the local autonomy given to municipalities. Consequently, uh, Supreme Court decisions limit the power of regional and local government in implementing policies for protecting fundamental rights under the justification that the federal government has the jurisdiction to deal with, with, with this issue. How can we push for a change in this constitutional interpretation and overrule this precedent without changing the constitutional design of mega cities or the federal system. This change has been done by constitutional adjud adjudication, but we may need to consider a more radical textual, textual change uh, to our constitution. How can we establish constituent power in a time of authoritarian power structures? Here in Brazil, discussions for a new constituent assembly are becoming alarming because of the danger of political retrocession. Sorry for my English. This may not be the best time to think about this form of constitutional change. From the point of view of rethinking democratic theory and liberal constitutionalism, rethink the constitutional role of megacities may, in fact, be an element of resistance and promotion of human rights since they are precisely those who feel the dramas and are committed to their absence policies to enforce human rights in diverse, plural, and complex public space. The problem is how to promote these reforms. Another point established in the book is that some cities protected LGBTQ rights or women and reproductive rights also deal with all policies for the refugees crisis, which involves all the responsibilities in housing, healthcare, education facilities. Even when their states do not provide or deny such legal protections. These are called sanctuary or human rights cities. I didn't know about this name, uh, I, I realized with your book. 
how can we think of a different international order in which uh, mega cities as sanctuary or human rights cities, which are precisely committed to this agenda of human rights, diversity, tolerance, solidarity, and the reception of refugees, have direct force and protection under international human rights law. Your book shows precisely that we have a new organization different from uh, the one conceived in the 18th and 19th centuries and that we need a new state law in which the state's vision is rethought, no longer from the national state perspective, but from the entities that are committed to human rights. In this sense, would we be able to strengthen the ide ideology of liberal constitutionalism as the metropolis create shared spaces and the experience of tolerance and diversity? How to insert cities in these formal city systems for the protection of human rights? Is a poorly international perspective possible without uh, constitutional change? Um, another uh, point uh, is that, and I'm ending, <laughs> uh, the Brazilian constitution establishes as one of its objectives, the reduction of social, social and regional inequalities. Brazil has a historic regional inequality between especially the South and Southeast, the wealthiest and most industrialized regions, and the North and Northeast regions. How to think about the empowerment of mega cities without further enlarging social inequalities in those regions? Would we not consider the damaging effect of the omission of public policies and private investments in non-urban areas that we have also a uh, silence? Um, and the last uh, thought is uh, that you talked uh, about non-territorial federalism and bring the example of the Maori in New Zealand that have seats at the, their parliament. But how to think this in Brazil is another challenge. We should put an indigenous representation in our national Congress and the other minorities, how to implement and organize their standing. Uh, these were my thoughts, uh, Professor, uh, and thank you again uh, for dividing your time to discuss these uh, mega cities problems. Thank you, Stefania. Thank you, Stefania. Now, Virgilio. Hi, everybody. Are, are you listening? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, first of, first of all, I would like to, to thank Stefania and Diego for the invitation. Uh, most of you don't know, but I, I was not invited because of any logic, uh, knowledge of constitutional law, but only because I live in a mega city. Actually, they tried to invite my neighbor, but uh, they, uh, he rejected and they simply invited me. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here virtually to, to be the discussion of uh, RAND's uh, insightful book today. I have to start my time here. And uh, I would like to say that at least uh, in my case, it, there's an, an additional reason why it's a pleasure to be here to discuss constitutionalism and mega cities. As uh, some of you may know, my father was actually, he still is, a uh, constitutional scholar. But in the, in the very beginning of the 1980s, he started to study and publish things that a constitutional scholar at the time, and even now, uh, was not supposed to study, such as uh, urban and environmental issues. And for a long time, even I myself used to, to wonder, 
what do her urban and environmental issues have to do with constitutional law? And now we're here today discussing similar issues and I'm really happy uh, for this occasion. But uh, enough with introduction, now I have less than nine minutes, but I'll, I'll try not to be the, those who are uh, invited to be discussing and try to be the lecturer. I'll finish on time. Uh, I'd like to make three types of considerations today. One very general on the subject of the book as a whole, then a group of considerations on the Brazilian context, and finally some questions relating to, to the solution Rand suggests for bringing cities to the foreground in constitutional thought in the 21st and in the 22nd century. And I'll often play the role of the devil's advocate. Yeah, I like to provoke a little bit. And uh, starting with the general issue, uh, Ren, your book is on the constitutionalism, on constitutionalism and cities, more especially mega cities. Uh, your diagnosis is, is precise. Cities and especially mega cities have almost never deserved the attention of constitutions and also of constitutional scholars. And this is really astonishing since the majority of the world population live in those cities. Uh, my general question here is as follows. Quite often, you argue that the history of constitutionalism is a history of suppressing the local in favor of the national, uh, in a couple of cases of, of the regional or the state members, but usually the nation. Uh, that is, uh, constitutions are all about the nation states and sometimes member states of provinces, but never never or almost never on local power but uh, local power is not necessarily city power not to mention mega city power uh, still those two things are not always distinguished i think uh, it's true that throughout the book you address issues that are really particular to cities especially in the last chapter but not only throughout the book but i still have a feeling that uh, at least in the background and sometimes in the foreground but at least in the background your main dichotomy was frequently the local against the national power uh, or the local against the state power and not the urban against the rural power. After all, the opposite of city is not the state, but, uh, but the nation or the nation, but the rural areas. Uh, so summing up, uh, who deserves more constitutional recognition, the city or the local power? If the city, how to differentiate both, uh, the city and the local. Take Sao Paulo as an example. One third of the area of the municipality of Sao Paulo is a rural area. If I want to empower the city of Sao Paulo, I necessarily want to empower this rural area as well or not, or I must differentiate both. And let's talk a little bit about Brazil. Uh, one of the most frequent notes I kept writing when I, re I was reading your book was not in Brazil, not in Brazil. Uh, not because Brazil is better or worse, just uh, uh, in several occasions when you describe the situation of local power and cities, and especially their constitutional status, the description uh, most, most frequently than not uh, does not apply to Brazilian case. Brazil has a very long tradition in recognizing the local power. After the independence, for instance, the emperor sent the constitutional draft of Brazil's first constitution, not to a national assembly or to provisional legislature, but to city councils. Of course, those city councils we're not in the position of rejecting the draft, but still this is a very symbolical act of recognition of local power for good or bad. Uh, and one of the most important books to understand Brazil is surely that one written by Vitor Nunes Leao in, in the 1940s, whose so title was The Municipality and the Representative, and the Representative Government in Brazil. And uh, Victor Nunes was one of the most important public scholars in Brazil in the 20th century and later justice of the Supreme Court. Of course, I don't have the time to develop more on that tradition of recognizing the local power and the different meanings, good or bad, of this recognition. But the 1980 constitution is the most actual evidence, I think, uh, uh, of this recognition, uh, of the recognition of municipality in Brazilian constitutional law. Um, in your book, when you, when you briefly analyze the Brazilian case, you focus, your focus was entirely on Article 182 and 183, uh, that is on urban policy as well on the City Act of 2001. These are surely important provisions, but I, I think for the subject of your book, there are also very important other articles. Uh, uh, the constitutional status of municipalities uh, is defined elsewhere in the Constitution. I don't want to read constitutional articles here, but I would like to mention a couple of them. Uh, 
the first place, Article 1 and Article 18 define municipalities as part of the federation on a par with states. I know there is no Senate for municipalities, uh, uh, but in other matters, municipalities have at least as much power and autonomy than states have, sometimes even more. Um, and this status is confirmed by the whole chapter four of Title Three of the Constitution, Article 29 to uh, 31, which established the political autonomy of the municipalities and their legislative and political powers. It's very important. This is not devolution. It's not devolution at all, as usually in most jurisdictions. This is federalism. Municipalities are component units of Brazilian federalism. And there's nothing, nothing states can do against it. Uh, second, uh, concerning cities and megacities, main article is Article 25, Paragraph 3, uh, which provides for the establishment of metropolitan regions, urban clusters, and micro regions, and also the Metro Metropolis Act of 2015 that regulates these issues. And of course, money, uh, Article 156, the uh, taxation power of municipalities, and other uh, articles. So, the constitutional status of municipalities in Brazil, it's guaranteed by the constitution, it's not devolution, it's part of federalism. I, I would like to hear from you a little bit more uh, about this. And the case of Brasilia is also very interesting. Brasilia is not DC, it is a state and the municipality at the same time, it has all the powers of a state and all the powers of municipality, representatives in the Senate, etc., etc. So it's, it's even more powerful uh, to some extent than Mexico City and Buenos Aires. So why uh, are housing issues and transportation issues in Brazil so bad? I think it's not because of, their, of its constitutional status, but because of bad policies. Uh, I would like to very shortly say a little bit something about Sao Paulo. Uh, the, the budget of Sao Paulo of two, uh, 2019 is 6 billion reais. Uh, proceeds from municip municipal taxes, 42 billion. So 70% of the budget of Sao Paulo come from municipal taxes. Transfer from central government, only 6%. Transfer from state government, only 1%. Uh, uh, and then other municipal sources, 10 billion, 17%. So the budget of Sao Paulo is made of almost 90% of resources from the city itself, taxes and other sources. So more than Tokyo is your, your example in the book. So uh, if it's true that most cities in Brazil are financially dependent on the central government, this, this has less to do with their constitutional status. That is, it's not because they don't have autonomy, especially fiscal autonomy, but to a great extent, it's exactly this autonomy that led to the creation of thousands and thousands of municipalities of, after the enactment of the 88 constitution, almost, almost all of them being completely financially not viable. So uh, it's a, and, and still Sao Paulo has lots of problems. Again, I don't think it's because of a lack of taxation power or, or, or similar things, but because of bad policies. Um, so uh, I think municipalities have political autonomy, fiscal autonomy, legislative powers, and even municipal constitutions. Uh, the problems they have experienced has less to do with this and uh, with the elites that dominate the power. And uh, my final thoughts, I have only 30 seconds, my God, um, about the, your last chapter. I would like to, to comment upon a little, uh, some of the issues. The first one is representation. This is one of my favorite subjects. It was my first, very first research subject still when I was an undergraduate student. I think there's a lot of, to discuss here. Uh, we don't have time, but only a few words. Uh, do cities have represent representation in central government? Formally not, uh, but there is no Senate for cities, but they have representation. Great number of members of the House of Representatives in Brazil are elected in big cities. Uh, but at, at least as important as the representation, and I know my time is over, I'll, I'll finish. Uh, the sen uh, even more important than the representation in the central government is representation in city council. In the last chapter, you address this issue of very densely areas in mega cities. I think this is one of the most in interesting insights of the book. Uh, but as you stress, the problem is not only density, but involuntary high density. If I decide to live uh, in Manhattan or in Jardins in Sao Paulo or Ipanema or Leblon in Rio, it's my problem. I don't need more voice than I already have. 
But people living in communities such as Paraisopolis that you mentioned in the book or Rocinha, they need. But how can, can, how could I translate the idea, this idea into a functioning electoral system? Well, plural, plural voting is always a dangerous move. So uh, I would like to hear a little bit more uh, uh, from you about this. And I, this last thing, uh, uh, I think it's enough. Uh, it's 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll respect the time. And I have a couple of things more. We can exchange some idea. I don't want to be the, uh, okay, 10 minutes is over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And sorry uh, for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Virgilio. So uh, now Ron will have the chance to react to his comments and uh, maybe we will have time for one question from the audience. Please, Ron. Thank you, uh, Diego, and in particular, thank you to Virgilio and to Estefania for raising such interesting issues. And uh, I doubt I have the time to address each and every of your thoughtful comments in great detail. So I'll try to lump some of the issues you, you raised together and maybe we should publish a symposium somewhere dealing with the, with the specific, because I mean, these are fascinating issues that you raise. Taken together, they just confirm everything I thought when I started to write this book and to think about it, that there are so many issues here that require collective thinking and that there is no way a single scholar um, can um, address in a single book all these issues and that they may be applicable to all countries around the world. So definitely there are many outliers and obviously if we believe that uh, every scholar is to some extent a reflection of his or her uh, constitutional landscape. The fact that I've been working in uh, North America mainly over the last uh, 25 years um, surely is reflected in my depiction of the book, uh, my depiction of cities in the book, because in North America and to a large extent in Europe as well, the status of cities is very different than the status of cities in Brazil. So my first general response to the two sets of really thoughtful comments, and I am grateful for you taking the time. I know it's not easy for anyone these days to engage with new ideas, but maybe it's a nice way of escaping the reality. So um, um, that is dismal in many respects for all of us. Anyway, um, my first reaction is that mainly from what Virgilio said, and also reflected in some of Estefania's uh, comments, that maybe Brazil could take the lead and not Brazil, the country, you, scholars of constitutional law in Brazil, can take the lead globally in advancing creative thinking about the status of cities, precisely because, as Virgilio mentioned, and I'm definitely not going to quarrel with his observations on the status of, you know, the local tradition in Brazil and, uh, you know, taxation authorities and, th and, and things of that nature and representation in city councils. This is precisely what I had in mind when I suggested, and this is a main theme in the book, that unlike many quote unquote canonical concepts in constitutional law that tend to infiltrate for better or worse from the global north, from the west, from American thinking, from German thinking, from um, British thinking, etc., into the so-called global south. In the context of cities, it's precisely constitutional traditions emanating from countries such as Brazil that may enrich the conversation and offer some solutions. So I think for me, the right move is not so much to show that some of the books, the book's arguments may not be applicable in their entirety to situation in Brazil, but rather to re-emphasize how the situation in Brazil may enrich and enlighten the conversation about the status of cities in North America and in Europe. This is one of the things that 
Brazil's constitutional legacy. And this is not just, you know, uh, this is black on white written. Obviously, the Constitution of Brazil, 1988, is the first of its kind to institutionalize all these things. And it's not a trivial accomplishment. How many constitutional law scholars in Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Harvard or Yale know that? I don't think too many. So just imagine Americans, uh, what, would what would have happened if Americans invented um, ideas or came up with ideas like this? So if at all, this is a confirmation or reaffirmation that novel thinking should come from the global south on this. And I will admit that the book is more, uh, was written in with the North American and European situation in mind. Um, going back to some of the specific comments, um, Virgilio raised the issue of uh, practically where to draw the line. And urban and rural are not, you know, this is not a dichotomy. It sounds too neat to divide countries into urban areas and rural areas. In reality, we have this phenomenon known as urban sprawl, and it's very difficult. So many live in the so-called suburban. So it's very difficult to draw not just the jurisdictional lines, but geographically to decide who belongs and who does not. One of the challenges and the big differences is that cities don't have borders. They don't have formal passports or citizenship. They don't have official membership regimes. So people can come and go. It's not unlike countries that they have borders and passports and citizenship, citizenship regime. So one of the difficulties, and excuse the big words here, is to define the demos, the demos of the city, who belongs and who does not. So one of the challenges here is to transfer the whole idea of belonging from a substantive identity-based one to basically territory-based one. So this is membership based on where you are. And this in itself, political membership on based on where you are, and this in itself is a radical concept because the whole notion of political membership statewide is based on other ideas, not just where you are. Obviously not everyone that is physically in Brazil is a member of Brazil's polity. So I don't have a, um, a clear answer to this, but I will say that it's very challenging to draw the boundaries of the demos when we talk about big cities. Um, on um, the, you know, so the not in Brazil, uh, co a frequent comment when Virgilio read the book, um, I take it, as I said, as a, as a reaffirmation that there's a lot to be learned from the Brazilian situation. Um, on capital cities, so, you know, Brasilia, I'm not sure if it's a good example um, because it's a capital city. And just to be clear, at least 50 or 55 percent of world constitutions recognize capital cities as capital cities. But this is not a recognition of the urban condition in those places. This is a recognition of these cities as capital cities. So it's part of the statist project. It's not part of the, it's not devolution of authority to these cities. And uh, um, I think the, 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 the most significant example of that nature is Delhi in India, that is the capital and also a massive mega city of uh, more than 20 million. On the issue of involuntary density, and I'm, I'm going from, you know, backwards with the comments, involuntary uh, high density, this is a critical issue. And I think Virgilio here hits the nail on its head. This was, it's just five or 10 pages in the book, but it was by far the most challenging part to, re to, to explore and to write and to think. And in my next book, I hope to devote more time to the issue of density in new constitutional thought. So you're right, Virgilio, that there is a difference between voluntary high density, people choosing to live in Manhattan, and involuntary high density. Um, still strikes me that, 
and I, I bring in the book and I hope I was accurate with the details. There's this stunning study of life expectancy differences in various neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. I hope you, you picked it up. This is unbelievable. So with constitutional status or without constitutional status, the fact is that in some neighborhoods of Sao Paulo, and you will know the names and, you know, um, um, et cetera, life expectancy is between 75 and 80 years. And in some other neighborhoods, just 10, 15 kilometers away, you know, 15 subway stops away, is 55 to 57 years life expectancy. So 20 years difference of life expectancy within the same city. So it strikes me that however um, um, improved, not ideal, but improved city status is or may be in Brazil, I very, I mean, I, I, and I, I will have to uh, defer to what you said, but I still think that underrepresentation at central and state government must account for some of the policies. Sure, it's most of it is politics. I mean, look, I wrote towards the aristocracy. I'll be, I'll be the first to admit that I don't want to say everything is political, but you know, a lot is political. But we as constitutional scholars have to think creatively about how to avert this. And I, I find it hard to believe that the urban agenda in, understood as those life expectancy gaps and poverty and issues, not urban agenda in terms of, you know, high rises at the core center of Sao Paulo, uh, enjoys equal representation at the, at the central and uh, state uh, institutions. So, uh, we need to think creatively here, and I have uh, more questions, just like you, Virgilio, than answers. But uh, it's an inv and, and I'll have to think more creatively about the good points that you raise. And all, on all those subjects, or sorry, articles in the Brazilian Constitution, um, obviously, uh, you know, there's a big. If you read the book, and of course you two read the book, you know that it deals with some. I don't know, 40, 50 jurisdictions, including the split of DACA, the, you know, what's not in that book. I think the list of, of countries that are not there is shorter than the list of countries that there are there. So it's quite a challenge to pack all these ideas in 300 pages and to, I did my best and, uh, you know, maybe in the second edition, I'll address those provisions, but, uh, but definitely thank you for that. Uh, more food for thought uh, for me. On um, um, uh, Stefania's uh, ideas, also very challenging and, and thought provoking. Obviously, I won't be able to address everything you said because you raised, I think, four or five big issues and each of them deserves a lecture. Uh, and I have a couple of minutes. But I will say that in terms of uh, designing uh, electoral, creative electoral systems, there's a lot to think about here. And I just scratched the surface of so-called mixed districts, you know, joint rural urban districts. And we can think creatively about this, about the idea of split cantons, so that a state that has one big city and other suburban and rural areas is split without changing its overarching number of representations to so that there is no mutual enforcement of norms. We can think about the concept that in American constitutional thought is known as community standards, that the constitution is interpreted, there is some leeway in interpreting the constitution so that it applies slightly differently or margin of appreciation in the European context, that it applies slightly differently to various areas of the country, including the urban, the suburban, the rural. So the idea of community standards, we can think about it creatively. And let's not forget here, in Europe at least, cities where the basis, the origin of collective identity, they embody the Republican idea of membership from Athens 
through late medieval Europe. So the modern European nation state started from cities. It's not crazy to think about a concept of city-based collective identity that is complementary to nationwide ideas. But I think the main point you raised, uh, Stefania, here was how not to alienate, um, let's call it rural areas. And I think we have to think creatively about another idea that I raise is mixed, um, you know, proportional first past the post electoral systems that may say in cities have proportional representation, in rural areas have first past the post, and then, and uh, in Scandinavia and Germany, they have this system. We have a, a, an added bunch of seats that are allocated to rural areas on top of that split so that ultimately the interests of rural and urban areas are represented in much fairer way without um, this constant notion of mutual imposition of ideas that neither the rural nor the urban are pleased with. Uh, but we definitely, there's lots of, uh, I have a new article coming up on the urban rural distinction and what to do with it. Uh, lots to think about. Um, think about, you know, 2000 articles on presidentialism, semi-presidentialism, parliament, what 2000? 22,000 articles on this. Maybe the time has come for someone to read and to, to write a good article on the rural urban divide and what to do with it in constitutional thought. I'm trying, but it's not, certainly not, it cannot be a one man band. You have to help me. Um, one more thing, and maybe I'll conclude here, Stefania, is the whole notion of um, self aid by cities. Can cities do things even without constitutional change? And many of them have started to do this. You know, there are human rights cities. There are networks concerning environmental protection, including the C40 that now has almost 100 cities. And they are very effective, relatively speaking, in the context of environmental protection, precisely because environmental protection is a new issue on the world agenda. So most constitutions do not address it. And so most constitutions do not suppress city power specifically on that. So I guess there is a gap here that, cons that cities can, and many things that cities do, have to do with environmental protection. So they can do this. Uh, and we see that they've been doing it. Um, I'm more skeptical on ideas such as urban citizenship. You know, some uh, American cities and some European cities and sanctuary cities have tried to toy with the idea of urban citizenship. I think this is a direct attack on the status project. And if you attack the, the exclusivity or the hegemony or the dominance of the state in issuing membership, uh, in determining membership criteria, um, this is not going to go very far and states are going to get quickly pissed off with this idea. But human rights cities and international networking uh, is definitely something that cities can do and have been doing relatively effectively. The problem is, and as I note in the book, that for the most part, these initiatives leave, live beside the constitutional order. They have not yet been incorporated into the constitutional order. And if there's one thing I would add, I would urge constitutional activists to do who care about the right to the city is to perhaps talk less and here I'm going to say something bold, perhaps talk less about identity issues that are just applied to the city context. They are general and applied to the city context and talk more about how cities can incorporate international human rights and international environmental law standards into their jurisdiction. Uh, but obviously our time is up and we could go on and on. And I'm happy to take a question if there is time, but if there is not, let me just thank you again for uh, taking the time to engage with the ideas. And I hope I have launched this open inv invitation and I've convinced you 
that urban agglomeration is a big issue, that the Global South has a role in you as public intellectuals who work in one of the leading Global South jurisdictions that has done a lot to address the urban situation has a responsibility to spread the word and to teach North Americans and Europeans, or to at least to suggest to North Americans and Europeans what may be done in the context of protecting or at least addressing the challenge of urban agglomeration worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much. If um, maybe if you could give us five more minutes. Sure. Beyond our initially agreed time. Thank you. So we can ask one question from the audience and uh, it's from Daniel Bogea. So I'll begin, begin quotation marks. I'm reading from his comments. He posted a question on the chat if you just want to follow the, the exact words, but I'm going to read it because maybe some people in the audience are not reading the chat. So, uh, Professor Herschel, from the Brazilian, Brazilian perspective, I would like to point out that the assumption that larger cities are more progressive may be misleading. There is a broad array of explanatory variables in this equation beyond inequality, such as religion and the usage rate of new technologies and social networks. A recent work by Brazilian political scientist Jair Nicolau presents decisive evidence that depicts the rise of Bolsonaro and the alt-right movement as an urban movement. So how can we address these complex local conditions in a comparative framework? So here, uh, my answer is uh, fairly decisive. And I think that Brazil and to some extent India uh, are, outli are global outliers. So the evidence on uh, the urban, non-urban split in terms of support for um, so-called nationalist populist uh, movement is absolutely clear uh, in most countries. And I mentioned some of the examples and next week we will have elections in the US and obviously the same phenomenon will come to the fore again. The vast, in the vast majority of constitutional jurisdictions worldwide, um, cities are home to more liberal, more socially progressive, more cosmopolitan views, so much so that even in places such as Turkey and Hungary, one, you know, two of the most, you know, and, and the same goes for Poland, by the way, you know, some of the countries that um, are always, you know, put forward in the context of, oh, you know, nationalist populism or gripping, gripping the world, Istanbul elected an anti-Erdogan progressive mayor and the same in in budapest just a couple of min, uh, months ago if you look at the polish elections results from last month it's the same story so i'll take I, I i'm not in a position to quarrel with any studies on brazil i will say that in india we also have some support for modi that is based in in hindu centered or hindu dominant cities so this is not, not just in India, it, not just in Brazil, it's in India as well. But generally speaking, the evidence is overwhelming. Cities tend to be much more progressive, much more diverse than um, non-cities across the world. And uh, the examples are obvious and out there. If Brazil is an outlier, then, um, you know, there is some Brazilian exceptionalism in this context and there's little I can say about it. I'm happy to take another question if you want. Um, okay, so uh, there is another question here from uh, Lucas. So I study, thank you, Professor Ran. I study urban planning and management, focusing on communication policies and systems theory. I think the Brazilian constitutional arrangement for cities is positive for the autopoiesis of the urban dynamics to make choices and execute changes according to the needs of local populations, but it makes it more difficult to autonomously gather resources in order to do so. This contradiction generates gaps between the 73% cities in Brazil that have less than 20,000 inhabitants each and the other 27% that have at least, at least uh, an urban master plan. How is it in Canada? What do you think about this economic gap that makes cities so different? So I'm not sure 100% that I follow the question, but, but if I do, I will, you know, it's always difficult when you read 
uh, someone else's question and you're not sure what the intention is. Um, but I will say that the, the issue of pooling resources for big, big projects and big, big um, agenda issues is, of course, uh, a major one. But the, you know, the fact still remains that Sao Paulo has some, what, 20, 22, 25 million, depending on how you count, and Cyprus has 1 million. So you know, just to pick on Cyprus, I mean, we could come with many other examples. The issue still remains that um, um, uh, those gaps between, um, so we can think about pulling resources in the context of regional urban autonomy. So some, some of the concepts that have been used in some countries is not to allow every locality to decide for itself, say 20,000, but to bring some localities together so that they can uh, form a more uh, powerful uh, force. In Canada, the situation is in many respects absolutely dismal. And if Virgilio's description of the situation is correct, and I have no reason to think that it is not, then Canada should be, dwellers of Canadian cities should be absolutely envious of uh, what has been going on in Brazil in terms of deference to the local. So in Canada, cities have close to zero planning power. And just to conclude on one Canadian episode, because I've heard so much about Brazil over the last nearly two hours. Um, in summer, I guess, again, the Global South issue, your winter 2018, our summer 2018, and you know Canada, we love our summer because the winter is bad. Anyways, Estefania was there a couple of years ago, so she knows. This says no Sao Paulo, my friends. It is no, no Rio. Um, anyways, um, the, the provincial government of Ontario, that's the state within which Ontario lies, essentially cut the city council into half and said that, you know, instead of 47 members of the city council, it will be reduced to 25 in the middle of electoral election to the city council. So, and there was absolutely nothing. The city of Toronto, seven and a half million people, home to every second immigrant to Canada. 20% of the population in Canada, in one city, there was absolutely nothing the city of Toronto could do and its city council was slashed into half in the middle of electoral process by the province. So maybe we should all, if we are all for um, um, urban power, we should move to Sao Paulo, or at least to the neighborhoods of Sao Paulo where life expectancy is 75, 80. Let me tell you, I have no appetite moving to uh, neighborhoods where the life expectancy is 55, because that means I'm done. So, um, I would rather move to places where the life expectancy is 80. We have another quarter of a century of good scholarship awaits. On that happy note, thanks everyone and uh, our time is up. I really appreciate the opportunity and good luck to ICONES and I really hope to see everyone physically once this entire global madness is over. Thanks so much, Professor Herschel, for your support and for this wonderful conversation. Thanks to Stefani and Virgilio for the comments. And uh, we continue this event in the afternoon with the Portuguese panel discussing mega cities, more specifically in the Brazilian context. So thanks everybody. And thanks also to Stefani's team for helping organize all the logistics and operations of this Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor. Thank thanks, lot. Virgilio. It was Bye, great, a great morning. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you.